We are getting ready to begin broadcasting coverage of our next live session, Controversies in Early Detection and Treatment of Sepsis. This meeting will cover a range of topics, including early detection in emergency departments and patient wards, as, as we just discussed here, and it will also address the sepsis definitions, along with new research in sepsis. Our final guest today on Critical Connections live broadcast from Congress will be Krista Shore, a nurse leader within the Surviving Sepsis Campaign. She will be joining us and sharing her insights immediately following the session. Remember to follow us along at hashtag SCCM Live. Good morning and welcome to the session titled Controversies in the Early Detection and Treatment of Sepsis. Despite the fact that sepsis is a leading cause of ICU mortality and, and the number one most costly diagnosis for which we treat patients in the hospital, critical care providers are challenged by uncertainties relating to, to the very basics of it, including the definition of sepsis, it's, it's a moving target, the diagnosis of sepsis, how to do that early and accurately, and, and of course then it becomes a challenge to properly treat the patients, and even the guidelines that are relating to that have, have shifted a little bit too. So that's really the goal of this session, is to help kind of resolve some of these issues and maybe just point directions for future uh, clarification. Before getting started, I, I have to uh, announce that this is going to be a live telecast. Uh, the session has been assigned its own hashtag to encourage conversation around today's topic. We will be taking questions during the Q&A session at the end of the session, including those from Twitter. If you're tweeting, please use hashtag surviving sepsis along with hashtag SCCM live. With that, I'm very pleased to introduce our first, and as it turns out, she will also be our last speaker today, Dr. Tiffany Osborne, who is a professor of surgery and emergency medicine at uh, Washington University in St. Louis. She's uh, the first uh, female to have been promoted to that position in the United States, and um, she has earned it by doing uh, great work in the field of sepsis, including a lot of the, the studies that, uh, as I was finding out as I was preparing for the session, uh, she uh, had contributed to almost all of the session, uh, all the, the important uh, studies that relate to this session. So with, uh, with that introduction, uh, I will hand it over to Tiffany. Well, thank you so much, Elliot. And also thank you to you and SCCM for inviting me to participate today. I, it's appreciated and quite an honor to be here. So, um, improving early detection. Uh, first of all, disclosures. Um, I'm on the uh, advisory board for Vivan Intellectual Disclosures. I have a lot. So improving early detection, I really feel like this centers around three main things, which is precision, process, and people. So when we talk about precision, I think that um, Dr. Chris Seymour really said it well when he said that the definition is created based upon its intended purpose. So when you're looking at a definition, you really need to think about what is the purpose for which you need to use and apply it. So when I'm in the ICU, my purpose is really focused around specificity. I have a limited number of beds. And also, if I'm looking at a patient and I think they're gonna be okay, but I guess wrong, um, they're still in a monitored setting. So if something changes, I can fix that later. I can make accommodations. However, when I'm working in the emergency department, I'm really much more focused on sensitivity. Because if I am wrong here and I send them home, the potential implications are much more ominous. So a good friend of mine that I used to work with, a guy by the name of Andy Perrin, used to say that the eyes will only see what the mind is willing to consider. And I just want us to think for a minute what our minds are being asked to consider when we're thinking about what we're looking for, i.e. how we're defining sepsis. When we're talking about sepsis, which definition are we referring to? Are we talking about the established definition? Are we talking about the CMS definition, which is similar to the established definition with a few caveats? Are we talking about the sepsis three definition, which is very different, or are we talking about the surviving sepsis campaign definition? Now this is probably by far what I get the most questions about. 
What are the difference between these definitions and what are the implications of their use? And in general, the communication that I receive is usually within two groups. One is, hey, you're so frustrated, you just don't know what to do with yourself, and I was in that place too. Or you're coming up and whispering something in my ear because you think you're the only one that's confused, that you're alone in your confusion and you don't want anyone else to know. Well, I'm here to tell you that you are not alone, okay? I, this is the thing that I hear and I get questions about more than anything else right now. So we're not gonna go into all the details, but let's just make sure that we have a few things straight for our conversation today. When we're talking about sepsis, if you're looking at the established definition that used by CMS, we're talking about that group that we sort of screen with, you know, that we keep in our eye on um, with uh, infection and, and SERS criteria. The Surviving Sepsis Campaign guidelines, their definition was what we used to call severe sepsis. And what's important about that is that lactate is included and hypotension is excluded. Whereas with the sepsis-3 definition, you're using two or more SOFA criteria. What's important here is that lactate is not part of that definition and that hypotension is included in that definition. Meaning that if you have a hypotensive patient who's on vasopressors and the lactate is not elevated, either because the value is normal or because you didn't draw it, it is considered to be sepsis. Now, there's a lot of clinical implications that we've talked about, and again, a lot of this depends on the purpose. I'm gonna to talk to you about something that maybe you haven't considered yet. So when we think about how we're judged as good doctor, good um, nurse practitioner, good nurse, good hospital, bad hospital, those are based on some type of case adjustment. And that case adjustment is typically, regardless of the country that you're with, there's usually a case adjustment that's involved with that. That case adjustment is usually also put on top of some type of mortality index. When you're looking at what are the observed number of deaths over the expected number of deaths, now, observed is fairly easy to figure out who died, who didn't die. Expected, how do you think that's determined? So that's determined by the diagnoses that you use. So if you have a hypotensive patient who has pneumonia, they're on vasopressors, and their lactate level is normal, you choose to use the sepsis-3 definition, and you call this patient sepsis, but the quality um, improvement specialists who are either looking at you as an individual or looking at your institution is looking at that and saying that that looks like septic shock but they're only gonna judge it based on what you put down as sepsis. So what does that mean? That means that your mortality is going to be high, your observed mortality will be high, but your expected mortality because of what the, the definition that they assign to the word sepsis is gonna be low. So your mortality index is high. Well, what does all of that even mean? What that means is that your care will look worse regardless of how good your, the care is that you deliver based on the definition that you're using. So this is an important component that you may want to consider. We talked a little bit about lactate. Now, when you're looking at these three definitions, how is this important? Again, when you're looking at the established or the CMS definitions, you can say lactate appears important to them. The surviving sepsis campaign, lactate is important. The, the sepsis three definitions, lactate is important if the patient is hypotensive. Now, the reason for this is very clear. This is what their data showed. Lactate did not, did not increase the sensitivity or specificity in the data set that they were using for their assessment. Now let's look at some other potentially high quality evaluations as well. So if you look at uh, promise, process, and arise, what do you think? What percent of patients were identified as being at risk based on lactate alone? So it's between 30 and 45% of patients. So lactate in this instance was really used as a screening tool. 
Additionally, when you look at lactate and its association with mortality, as lactate increases, there is an associated increase in mortality. Now, you can parse out the data as with vasopressors, without vasopressors, before six hours, after six hours. The, the slope of that line may change, but the trajectory is similar. Additionally, if you look at um, uh, Dr. Shakarhari's uh, very, very good review for the sepsis-3 definitions when he looked at previous data on shock. He has a table in there where he lists all of the different studies and the number of patients. So if you just divide this up into two groups and say, okay, look, normotensin and lactate greater than or equal to four, or hypotension, lactate less than two, how does that pan out? Well, normotension and lactate greater than or equal to four had a mortality of close to 30%. Hypotension, lactate less than two, had a mortality of around 30%. This group was included in the definitions. This group was not included in the definitions. In our data, when looking at the New York State um, uh, sepsis quality initiative for the Department of Health, what we found as well was that with increasing lactate, there is a increased associated mortality. And you can see here where new, but, but the issue here, what was interesting is that it interacted with comorbidities. It interacted with comorbidities. So we had to hold comorbidities constant when we looked at the lactate. So here you can see with uh, comorbidity zero, what the mortality is with increased lactate, and what they are uh, with comorbidities of four and increased lactate. So what this means is, yes, there's an association between lactate, or there's an associated increased mortality with, um, with lactate, increasing lactate but it seems to plateau with your increased number of comorbidities, so this could be an important component. So when I think about lactate, I say early and often. Um, applying that prospectively to an emergency department group um, observationally, you can see that when you're looking at a sicker group, which the QSOFA, your mortality is gonna be higher, and that mortality decreases based on the um, increasing sensitivity as you're capturing more patients, as well as um, decreased specificity. Now, what does that mean? Here you can take a look and see of infected patient deaths, how many were detected by each group, and if you're looking at surviving patients, how many were marked as being at risk of mortality in each group? So we talked about precision. This is an important component. We also need to talk about process. And when I think about process for early identification component, it's screening, management, and maintenance. Now here we used a screening tool. Um, this, we use this both, something similar in both the ED and on the floors. And this is a great example about how you need data. If you don't have data, if you can't monitor it, you can't manage it, okay? So the screening tool here was not working very well for the nursing staff. So instead of telling us, they kept clicking through the buttons. So our data was very disparate. We couldn't make anything out of it. When we realized the problem, we went back and fixed it, and, and uh, now it's being used more appropriately and giving us better data. But this is what we also use for the sepsis alert, and so hopefully you do have a, a prompting system. Nurse-driven order set. This in our institution was quite controversial, although I didn't really feel like it needed to be. In the ED, it was very easy to implement the nurse-driven order set. If we think, if our nurse who we, whose expertise we find valuable feels that either the screening tool was positive or that they feel like looking at the patient that they could potentially be septic, then they have the opportunity to have a nurse-driven order set where they can order blood cultures, lactate, x-rays, this type of thing. If the clinician felt that it was not helpful, then they could always um, uh, cancel it. Additionally, having a sepsis provider documentation where they could say that patient who has uh, elevated uh, white count and elevated heart rate and is on antibiotics is actually someone who just came up to the unit for an open femur fraction. They're not septic. So one button to say that this isn't what it is. And this based on, this is what, what's happened in our institution over time. We've come a long way with this plus a lot of other initiatives, um, but we still have quite a long way to go. Um, potential areas for the future that we're seeing now but maybe see more in the future. 
One is by using the EICU as a hub. This is our surgical and anesthesia critical care collaboration. Uh, Dr. Walt Boyle is overseeing that for us. But using that as a hub in order to manage these patients from, a, from um, with real data in real time and assist in prompting, prompting us when I'm in with a heart attack, I can now come in and say, okay, so there's something else going on with this patient. And I have to tell you, this is really exciting. This is actually Dr. Cruiser's data, talking about monocyte distribution width. You can look at this picture and see that there's a difference between the non-septic and the septic patient. And this had a, an additional association based on changing severity of illness. So you might be able to ask him about that in a few minutes. Artificial intelligence and computer learning, we're dabbling into this right now. And how this is going to come into play will be, um, uh, it's very exciting as we're moving forward. And I'm hoping that we're going to be able to use that. When we, when we look at threshold values in the emergency department, usually you only have one or two values. That's okay. But when you're talking about being on the floor, when you're talking about hemonc patients, when you're talking about post-surgical patients, really, we need to use detection devices that aren't just looking at threshold values, but how we look at the patient at the bedside, which is how they change over time. We look at the trend of the white count with the trend of the platelets, with the trend of the bands to make our decisions. So we talked about precision, process, and people, but really people needs to be first. Now this is maybe a quarter of my team when we were doing a talk a webinar for Vizient. We can't, you can't do this by yourself. There is no lone ranger here. Everything works better as a team. And with a team, you can make what seemed impossible, possible. So I want to thank you um, and appreciate your time. I just want to remind everybody we're going to reserve the questions for the end. So there will be two more talks, and then we'll uh, hopefully you guys can collect your thoughts and have some great questions uh, to ask us at the end. Okay, and with that, I'd like to introduce our next speaker, Dr. John Savransky, who's a professor of medicine. He's the, also the director of the ICU services at Emory University Hospital. He's the associate editor of Critical Care Medicine. He plays a lead role in the SCCM's Discovery Critical Care Network, and he does a lot of other things, including uh, participation in uh, many clinical studies in the areas of sepsis and ARDS. So, uh, with, with that introduction, I'd like to welcome John. Thank you, Elliot. Um, I actually need to disclose that when I was asked to give this talk, I had absolutely no idea what this title meant. Um, and they, they told me that I'm supposed to be talking about sepsis treatment. So that's really what I'm going to focus the next 10 or 15 minutes on, is how do you treat patients with sepsis? And it's probably worth summarizing what I'm going to say in the next two minutes, and then hopefully spending 10 minutes persuading you that what I'm going to say is correct. I had a statistics professor who taught me when I was younger that all models are flawed, but some models are useful. And I'd like to play on that or riff on that to say that all guidelines or all treatment rules are flawed, but some of them are useful. And I'm hoping to persuade you that flawed treatment requirements, and I think most of the people in this room would say that what we have are flawed, that following them will help your patients. So I too have a number of intellectual uh, disclosures. Um, and so you should take um, my biases uh, based on the fact that I've been on uh, a number of the surviving sepsis guideline committees. Almost 20 years ago, many rivers persuaded us that we ought to treat patients with sepsis with the same time-sensitive concern that we need to treat patients who have an acute MI. And that we need to treat them with the same speed and the same recognition of people who have trauma. And I think what the last 20 years have shown us 
is that finally, our usual care has caught up with Dr. Rivers' concept. And the recent studies of process, promise, and arise that did not show benefit in doing goal-directed therapy didn't show benefit because we've gotten better. We've gotten better at delivering care. And again, I'm gonna spend nine or 10 minutes persuading you of following flawed guidelines may help us get better. So there's a lot that's changed from the time that Dr. Rivers published his manuscript and today. The top selling car in the US hasn't changed. It's still the Ford F-150, even though it looks a little bit different. In 2001, Harry Potter's first uh, movie came out, The Sorcerer's Stone. And back in 2001, Billboard still managed the top selling, or they reported the top selling albums as top selling albums. Now you have to count how many downloads to Spotify it has when they do that. Um, there are different movies, but lots of things have changed. I've changed in the past 17 years, um, and I think it's evident by looking at that. So how are sepsis patients different? Well, if you look at the patients in the control arms of the Rivers study and the recent studies that were published, I think you'll see that we've gotten better. So in Dr. Rivers' original study, the SCVO2 of the patients in the control arm was 50%. His goal was to deliver antibiotics within the first six hours, and most of the patients achieved that. And the lactate, the mean lactate was about seven. When you compare that to the ARISE, the PROMISE, um, and the PROCESS trial, the median SCVO2 in the ARISE trial was 73%. Patients had gotten two liters of fluid by the time they had been enrolled, and the time to antibiotics was a little bit over an hour. And so I think the reason why there was no difference between goal-directed care and usual care is that we've gotten better. And there's some evidence to support that. The ANZICS group reported that from between 2000 and 2012, mortality from severe sepsis and septic shock dropped by about 1% per year. And this happened despite the fact that we've done miserably at coming up with therapies that directly work on the pathway of sepsis that directly block or modulate inflammation, coagulation, or anything else that we can block. And there have been a huge number of trials. I could spend half an hour talking about trials that didn't work. And to avoid depressing myself and you, I'm not going to do that other than to show a, a number of studies in high-impact journals that have not been successful at improving mortality in patients in sepsis. So if this hasn't worked, if none of these modulating therapies have helped patients, how have we gotten better? Well, I think the reason that we've gotten better is because we've tried to get better and we have gotten and continue to get feedback about how we're doing. So I want to show you three studies using flawed guidelines, using flawed guidelines that have improved outcomes in three different parts of the world. The first of them was done in Utah, a number of centers with Intermountain. And they did some things that most of us do for our patients. They gave antibiotics early, they measured lactates, they got blood cultures. They also, as part of their treatment bundle did things that most of us don't do. They considered the use of activated protein C, which we know doesn't work, and they controlled glucose, which we know if we control it badly, 
and we use tight glucose control, it increases mortality. They also used packed cells and dobutamine if the SCVO2 was under 70 percent. So they used a number of measures that at the time were the best that they knew, and they went from 1 in 20 patients when they started this performance improvement project, getting all of these therapies, to three in four patients. So they didn't hit 100 percent, and probably they shouldn't have. And during that time, the mortality dropped from 20 percent down to just under 10 percent. So people in Utah are healthy. Maybe you don't believe data from Utah. So um, how about Spain? Well, the edusepsis uh, group used the same or very similar flawed measures. They had a six-hour bundle and a 24-hour bundle, and most of the things in the six-hour bundle we still do, early antibiotics and other things. And on average, three of six patients got the things in the early bundle. And at the end of this educational campaign, that was mostly done by doing things we know don't work, showing PowerPoints, putting up posters. And they did one thing that we know do work. They provided feedback. So they moved from an average of three to four out of the six measures, and mortality went down in all of those ICUs. So if you don't believe Spain, if you want more data, the, the study that Tiffany showed before, looking at the mandated sepsis care in New York, following the death of a young boy, um, there was a lot of publicity. And New York State did what New York State usually does when, when something hits the media. They legislated something. Mm -hmm. They legislated the fact that everybody had to have a sepsis uh, protocol. And they picked three measures, again, not complicated, um, sending blood cultures, um, checking a lactate, and giving early antibiotics. And what they found was that if you followed these measures, there was an association with decreased mortality, and that most of this seemed to be with the administration of antibiotics. The other thing they showed was that not every patient got desired care. So we don't have a lot in our sepsis toolbox, but maybe we don't need much. Recognizing sepsis, which is complicated, giving early antibiotics, which if you recognize sepsis, isn't complicated, and having some sort of feedback loop to track how you're doing are the three major things in our toolbox. I have to say, we are far from the only profession that tries to deal with improving performance. And those of you with hairstyles similar to me may remember that 15 or 20 years ago, we went through a similar thing with acute MIs, trying to identify patients, trying to improve care. And here's some data from Worcester, Massachusetts, showing that people who had Q-wave MIs, that the mortality went down from just under 25 percent uh, to just over 15 percent, just by trying to improve the care of patients with with acute MI. And I think most people would agree that both MI and sepsis are time-sensitive conditions. While we have fewer things in our toolbox, we may have enough. The final thing that I think is going to help us continue to get better is that we now have a spotlight upon us. And most of the time, even though it can be annoying to have people look and see how you're doing. It also helps us think hard and remember that what we do is designed to improve the outcome of patients. This is a picture of Rory Stanton, who is the young boy who died of sepsis that led to the New York State law. They formed a foundation. There was a lot of publicity to the point now where you actually see the word sepsis in the news. And when Muhammad Ali died after aspirating, the news report noted that he died of sepsis. And this really helps, it helps me when I talk to families about it. And families sometimes ask, does this person have sepsis? There are also advocacy groups um, asking you to be sepsis smart. 
and SCCM has partnered with the Sepsis Alliance. Some of you may have seen the YouTube video that they've done. So I don't want to say that the future looks wonderful, right? We still have things to do, and it's pretty clear that even though providing feedback is helpful, there are a number of studies from institutions that are interested in delivering sepsis care that show that we still don't deliver early antibiotics to a large fraction of patients. The graph on your left is from the uh, Surviving Sepsis Campaign, showing that many patients require more than two hours to get antibiotics. And the graph on your right is from 35,000 ED patients um, from a manuscript last year from uh, Vinnie Liu, suggesting that many patients with sepsis and septic shock also uh, don't get antibiotics as quickly as we'd like them to do. So I know this is entitled Controversies. I, I don't think that, that the fact that sepsis is an illness to which time to therapy is important is controversial. Um, and that early recognition, timely antibiotics, and structured treatment is important. What I do think is controversial is the fact that following a flawed guideline and following a flawed measure, even though those measures are flawed, if you can get feedback and figure out how you're doing, I think the evidence shows overwhelmingly that your patients will do better, even if they're not perfect. I'd love to have perfect measures. There are lots of smart people working on them, and maybe in 10 or 15 years, we'll have perfect measures. Maybe sepsis will become a disease rather than a syndrome when we develop a biomarker, so we don't need all sorts of fancy things to diagnose it. Right now, we don't have that, but I think what we have is good enough for what we need to do. And I thank you for your attention. Well, that reminds me of uh, what our program director said to our fellows a couple years ago, saying that right now you know about as much as you're ever going to know in the field of pulmonary and critical care medicine. And he said about 16 years later, which was the time interval from which he had graduated from his fellowship program, he said, everything will be different by then. <laughs> so, but, but I think the point is uh, well taken that uh, any effort, uh, dedicated effort to address this issue in a timely fashion um, is going to make a, a positive impact. Uh, moving on to the next talk, I regret that uh, Dr. Townsend cannot be here uh, due to an emergency. He's an administrator at his um, institution and they had a crisis and he had to leave this morning at 7 a.m. But in the spirit of uh, emergency medicine, uh, we scrambled around and, and uh, Tiffany Osborne is here <laughs> to, to present instead. And actually, she had been involved in this study as well and knew the data. So uh, she will talk to you now about the reconciliation of sepsis 3 with uh, CMS SEP1 standards. Is it a minor adjustment or an extensive overhaul? So if John's talk was not controversial, I think anything involving CMS will be. How's that? <laughs> I'm happy to help with that. So um, hitting the mark. This is really going to be evaluation of the data as to where we're at right now. So we know that with the SEP1 bundle, we have the three-hour bundle and we have the six-hour bundle. So three-hour bundle, lactate, blood cultures before antibiotics, and antibiotics within three hours. I think if we look at what John just presented with the promise process arise and, and other studies, that that's a good idea, trying to get that in within three hours, probably a good idea. The six hour for severe sepsis is the, if the lactate was elevated, that you're repeating it. Now, if the patient was hypotensive, they get fluids. Now, here's the other piece. In the six hour for the septic shock, we've got vasopressors, repeat lactate if we need to, but this tissue perfusion assessment is now gone. So that is no longer part of the six hour bundle. I thought I would get clapping. <laughs> right. So um, 
when we look at this data is going to is affiliated with the previous tissue perfusion element, so some of this is not going to be pertinent moving forward. But I think it's helpful to see that the data was being used to make some of these uh, ongoing decisions. So when we look at it, around 325 or so patients were admitted with data, and about half of those were actually eligible for the bundle. Um, about 70% did not meet the actual severe sepsis criteria. And so what that means is when they were looking at diagnoses, they were looking at sepsis, severe sepsis, and septic shock, and several of these may have been patients who were septic and actually didn't uh, meet the severe sepsis or septic shock criteria. Also, you have exclusions for transfers and uh, antibiotic exclusions, et cetera. So when you look at how many patients that were started with based on quarter, you can see that there was probably around 110,000 patients nationwide per quarter. Um, around half of those met the severe sepsis three-hour bundle, and around 30,000 or so met the severe sepsis six-hour bundle. And we're getting closer to around 13, 14,000 that met the septic shock three-hour bundle, because remember, you have to meet the severe sepsis before you are then qualified as septic shock. And then uh, fewer patients that made the six-hour septic shock bundle, around four, four to 5,000. So when we look at the breakdown of this, severe sepsis in the three-hour bundle, pretty much 60 to 70% of patients who qualified for that three-hour bundle passed, meaning that they got the um, lactate, blood cultures before antibiotics, and antibiotics within that three-hour time frame. And again, after listening to John speak about um, process promise rise as well as other studies that looked at that three-hour mark, I think that we're, we're doing well with that. So when we're looking at the severe sepsis six-hour bundle, I remember for that, that was if they had an elevated lactate, did that lactate get repeated? You can see how it's increasing over time. So we're noticing what we're doing, we're getting better. And this is actually a good practice too, right? Because if the lactate is elevated, time to normalization is associated with improved survival. Again, here we're talking about the septic shock three-hour bundle. Around half of the patients passed, so we still have a ways to go. And when we're looking at the septic shock six-hour bundle, this is did they get vasopressors specifically? This is specifically associated with vasopressors. You can see that the majority of patients consistently across quarters got vasopressors when they had persistent hypotension and received fluids. Additionally, when we're looking at the septic shock uh, six-hour bundle, this is the tissue perfusion assessment. So this was the uh, physical exam that you had to do a lot of things on, <laughs> and, or, the, or the ECHO, or the um, SCVO2, or CVP, you can see that very few patients actually pass that, pass that information, pass that uh, part of the bundle. 30% um, was probably the best average that, that we had over quarters. When we look at the combined bundles, now remember again, this is also consist containing that tissue perfusion component, which is no longer a part of the bundle. Again, 30 to 45 percent pass rate. And remember that this was an all or none, right? So if you failed one part of the bundle, then you were going to fail the bundle. Um, so looking at this nationally by quarter, Number of hospitals, we have around 3,000 hospitals across the country who are participating. Eligible cases, around 100,000 or so. Um, performance per decile. So if we're looking at performance per decile, you know, you can see here, if you look here at preventable deaths that were improved, or the preventable deaths over the quartile, and the red line are the patients that did not pass, and the green are the patients that passed. So you can see that we had, you know, increased pass rate as we went through the quartiles. This is looking at uh, mortality associated with pass rate. So this blue line is pass rate. So you can see that as you continue to improve your pass rate, the mortality was um, continuing to decline. <clears throat> so in conclusion, 
The step one measure has gone through a refining and iterative process. So again, no longer is that tissue perfusion component a part of the, of the bundle. <clears throat> Um, the process involves ongoing engagement with multiple stakeholders, and, and that piece has been very important. And refining this really is associated with what are we going to do for our patients? Really trying to do the best we can with what we have. So we see now that we're looking at elements that I think the data support for our three-hour bundle. And then when we're looking at that six-hour bundle, it's if the lactate is elevated, we're repeating it. It's a good thing to do. We're looking at if the patient maintains um, hypotension, has persistent hypotension, then they need to have vasopressors. And then there needs to be some other bedside evaluation. Now all you need to do for that is check off and said, I did another bedside evaluation. Why do they have that? They have that because they feel that it's important that we're going back to the bedside and seeing the response to the treatments we are initiating. That's why that's there. So again, um, these were Sean Townsend slides. This is the information that he was going to present. So I thank you and I thank him for his work. Welcome back to Critical Connections Live. We have reached our final debrief of the day. So let me waste no time in welcoming our Critical Connections Live co-hosts, Dr. Lynn and Dr. Carol, along with our special guest, Krista Shore, to help break down the session we just saw. Krista, if you wouldn't mind, introduce yourself to the audience. Thank you, my name is Krista Shore. I am a clinical nurse scientist at Cooper University Hospital in Camden, New Jersey, and I've been fortunate enough to be involved with the Surviving Sepsis Campaign uh, as a nurse, uh, representing the, uh, the guidelines since 2004. Well, let's get started. Thank you so much for being here with us. And I think it's really nice that we can devote a really good chunk of time to uh, sepsis, how to treat it, and really how to get all of us to be able to do this collaboratively in our institutions. And you have a lot of experience in that. So one of the first questions I wanted to ask you was, you were involved in rolling this out to the ED and the wards. What are the differences in uh, detecting sepsis in those two different environments? So I think um, when we first started the surviving sepsis campaign, the low-hanging fruit was the ED because primarily 60 uh, to 70 percent of our sepsis patients arrive through our emergency department. Uh, so when you start a collaborative, that's probably the best place to start. Um, the nurses have uh, the ability to do uh, rapid assessment and critical thinking. Um, it's a very tight environment, the emergency department. Uh, when we roll the same uh, early identification performance improvement program out to the floors, uh, there are many, many units. Uh, the units are very diverse. You may have a medical unit, a surgical unit, um, step-down units, um, and the levels of expertise of the nursing staff is uh, varied. Uh, generally, a, a new nurse will start out on a medical surgical floor, so their knowledge base is, is uh, somewhat flat for the first year because they're still trying to get oriented to that particular facility. Uh, so the critical thinking skills is not something that um, they do on a daily basis because, to be quite honest with you, their work day is unbelievable. Uh, they may have six to eight patients. Uh, they may not even finish assessing and giving medications to all their patients for two to three hours into their shift. Uh, so it, it is somewhat different. Um, so they have some challenges uh, that are very different be between those two units for sure. Yeah, that's a great point. I did, we talked about this a little bit at the last talk that it does seem sometimes that we are very overburdening our bedside nurses with more and more tasks to do in another checklist. So it's great that we're, we're talking about that issue. Uh, I was wondering uh, that, you know, we're, we're a year out from uh, the surviving sepsis definitions. And one of the things that was talked about in the session was the differences between the different definitions. How do you deal with the differences between the definitions? And how are we supposed to sort that all out? I think it's certainly very challenging uh, for clinicians, uh, for sure. Um, from a nursing standpoint with early identification, it's really important that we have the ability to make the assessment in a, in a rapid fashion. Uh, so drawing a lactate is 
after you've actually identified a patient that's at risk. Um, so that's a tool that you can use, but you still have to be able to identify subtle changes in your patient. Uh, to be quite honest, the majority of uh, facilities that I've interacted with continue to use uh, the subtle signs that we've always used, the standard uh, sepsis definitions, the SERS criteria. Uh, does the patient have a, um, uh, a new cough or do they have a wound that looks red or have there been any changes uh, from one day to the next, um, especially on the floors? Those subtle changes um, that you can pick up really make a, a big difference. Uh, I think the sepsis three definitions really generated a lot of discussion. And again, they're proposed, right? So um, they generally will tell us who's gonna do poorly. Um, to, but our goal really is to identify the patients early. Uh, like Dr. Safransky mentioned about all the elements that we have in the toolbox. The one particular element that's likely the most important, it's the most difficult to measure, is how early can we identify sepsis? Because all the elements that we have in our toolbox are related to when do we identify? So if we don't give antibiotics on time, it's likely related to the fact that we didn't identify sepsis early enough. Yeah. Uh, so there are a lot of components that could go into whether or not we pass or fail the measures. And if you can't man measure it, you can't manage it. Like Correct. Like we talked about. Correct. Well, let's talk about the rollout and the, the, the work stress placed on the ward nurses a little bit more. Obviously, they're really busy um, I know that in a lot of institutions, there are now a lot of financial pressures to be ever more lean, to uh, eliminate positions. How does one introduce concepts like this and not have it look like just an additional task um, and you know really keep morale up? Do you, do you have any practical suggestions for the so rest of us? Actually, it was a really good point because when we rolled out our early identification on the wards, um, we identified one unit. And we identified a unit that had a lot of engagement with the nurses, mm -hmm. that they were excited about doing something new, that they were going to be the pilot unit. Uh, the nurse educator on that unit was very engaged um, in the process. But we also involved our uh, Six Sigma team uh, from the very start. So we spent probably three or four months mapping out all the steps. And one of the key components with the, uh, the floors is that the, um, the technicians who take the vital signs um, became a really important part of how that information is delivered to the nurse. So if we have techs that you know, do vital signs early in the morning and they notice something that was abnormal um, or concerning, they knew that they needed to report that to the nurse right away where in prior years they would take vital signs on all the patients on the unit and then put them into the computer so it may be an hour or so uh, later. Uh, but we did actually map out all the processes. Um, you know, how long does it take to get antibiotics to the floor? We're not like the emergency department. You know, we have to go down to the pharmacy, which is several floors. Um, so if the tube system is not working, or how do we deliver that to the bedside? Uh, so we were able to work with um, a multidisciplinary team and including the hospitalists. Um, so we actually try to stop using the buy-in term uh, because that means that we're trying to get people to believe what we want, um, whereas we encourage more engagement. So how can we make this work? And our first screening tool did not work very well. And the nurses were afraid to say something, but I could see it was taking them a long time. And I said, is there something we can do to make it faster? Um, so they really gave us a lot of information uh, to expedite the process. And uh, like most institutions, we have the 24-hour surveillance that's evaluating vital signs in labs and sending alerts to the nurses. But again, just initiated on one unit and working out all the bugs and then going to the unit across. So we did the north side, then the south side, and then we started to go down. And then once the hospital administration uh, seemed to be pleased with the way things were going, it just went hospital-wide. I'd like to hear a little bit more about that, getting people to be engaged is that a systems workflow or philosophical um, idea that you build in? Do, do you rely on a couple of people to really jumpstart that? How, how did that work? I think it's something that developed over time uh, because when I actually, I was doing a talk and I looked up, what does buy-in really mean? And it really means you're trying to get other people to believe what you believe. So they're try you're getting them to try to buy into your idea. Whereas in something this large, you need people to feel a part of what's happening, be a part of the solution. Uh, so that's a, just a different approach. And it seemed to work well uh, because we valued everyone on the team. 
the critical care technicians who take the vital signs, actually became the most important person on the general medical floor. Um, but there are some facilities where the nurses do everything, so they might not have access uh, to someone doing vital signs for them. Uh, so there are facilities that work somewhat different. So where do we go from here? Um, we had talked uh, in the off camera a little bit about how that golden hour may not occur in the hospital or may not occur in the emergency department, but may occur on the couch three days earlier. Mm -hmm. uh, how, do we, how do we go from here? How do we, what's our next steps? Um, in my opinion, I think that one of the most important things that um, has come out over the past several years, and I think it's a collaboration with the CDC and the World Health Organization and the Sepsis Alliance to really get the message out to the public. Uh, we need the public to actually understand that a simple infection um, can turn bad in, in a short period of time and you need to recognize the signs and symptoms, whether it's an adult, a child, you know, an infant. Um, so even with some of the work that we did here uh, with the Save a Life um, over the, the weekend to educate the public on what sepsis is and you know, it was interesting, you know, if we had a few families come up and ask us questions about their family members. Uh, so I think once that terminology, um, we can make people aware, I think that's really important. And for patients who are in the hospital that have survived sepsis, I think it's important that we educate them before they leave because they're more prone to another episode. So we want them to come back earlier than they did, the, you know, during the first episode and, and seek treatment if, if that's necessary. But having them understand the signs and symptoms and the, the severity, I think, is important. I think that post-care follow-up is really important as well, as we've learned during this meeting. Um, as many people will die within the first three to six months after a hospitalization for sepsis as will die in the hospital. So yeah. it's really important to take care of those patients, too. I agree. How does your hospital do that? Who, who does that education? So that's actually a very interesting point. Uh, with some of the work that I've done uh, for my doctor program, I really focused on patient mm. education. It really opened my eyes up to a need. Um, so we have done a great job, I think, as a critical care community and working with our hospitalists over the past several years, um, improving the care of patients. Um, but we failed, I think, to include the patients mm. in what we're doing. Um, so I think uh, this is gonna be a next step in helping the patients and families um, prior to being discharged, that we really have them understand this diagnosis, uh, what risks they may have um, after discharge, and when to seek um, healthcare provider attention. Um, but again, it, it's, it's a, at a different stage now where I think we really need to engage our patients and their families. Um, and that's the prime place because they were sick and we have their attention. Uh, so I think we can do a lot uh, during that particular hospitalization. And I, I agree, if those patients are readmitted, they're more likely to die um, on their readmission and, uh, or go to hospice care. So um, you know, that's something that I think we all need to start uh, reviewing. And I think the literature is just starting to come out on that. It's, it actually sounds really inspirational. It, you know, it's, it's so nice to think that we as the intensive care community are really thinking about the, 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 the patient and the family almost holistically. Mm -hmm. uh, I wanted to hear a little bit more about how you feel like uh, sepsis treatment and management has evolved for, for, for you as a leader and the way your hospital has approached <coughs> it. And I mean, having been involved for, for so many years now, I think it's amazing. Uh, like Dr. Safranci said, it's not perfect. You know, the, the guidelines aren't perfect, the CMS measures aren't perfect, but you have to start somewhere. Uh, you know, the, the literature has evolved over time and that's allowed us to change some of the ways that we do things, the way that we view um, our care. Uh, but the fact that we're talking about it is just making it better. Uh, the awareness is actually improving care. Um, and you know, best practices, they don't happen in one day. Uh, they develop over time. And I think as the you know, clinicians involved in this process, I think as long as we're aware and accepting of new literature and how we can incorporate that into our practice, we're only gonna make things better for our patients. Well, speaking as the voice of the public here, I believe education and awareness of s what sepsis is is hugely important, and not to alarm anyone, but especially just to inform. You know, so if there's anything else for Krista? No. Excellent conversation. Thank you Thank so you. much for being here with us this morning and wrapping up the sec se sepsis conversation for the day. And doctors, any other thoughts on today? 
Well, gosh, you know, for me, it's been a very exciting two days. I want to thank everybody for joining us, and I would like to thank the SCCM for having uh, me to uh, participate in this. For me, really, the entire experience has um, uh, been really inspirational, and I feel like everything sort of comes together. So we started out talking about, you know, a, almost a call to action by Dr. Zimmerman about making sure that we do the right care at the right time, thinking about doing less is more, but how, how do we reconcile that with all of the new technology, all the new skills that we have? We heard some really exciting stuff about technology that's coming down the road. Um, for me, it was also really inspiring to be reminded of how uh, international we are and how multi-professional we are. And um, again, call to action, the discovery network. Get everybody involved in trying to come up with out of the box ways to improve patient care. And you know, the SEC is going to SCCM is going to enable that. Yeah, I concur. This has been a fantastic meeting. I always leave these meetings incredibly energized and go back to my home institution ready to try these things. And I think most of us do when we go back there. I want to thank SCCM for inviting uh, for inviting me this year and for continuing to do this SCCM Live. I think it's a fantastic initiative, and uh, I really think it helps translate some of the discussion to the general public, as well as provide an opportunity to debrief, just like we've had here with some experts. Um, this has been a great program, and uh, I definitely look to forward to continuing the conversation online um, at Twitter. Uh, you can use the hashtag um, CCC47 for the Critical Care um, Conference 47. Uh, or SC, hashtag SCCM live. I look forward to seeing you online. Excellent. You guys deserve a round of applause. Huge and you do thanks. Too. Thank you to Dr. Carol and Dr. Lynn for sticking with us through this two day program live. The doctors did a tremendous job debriefing each session. I want to thank all of you for tuning in to another successful broadcast from the 47th Critical Care Congress here in San Antonio, Texas. You will be able to replay all of the materials from this live broadcast at sccm.org slash live. And all of the segments will be available on the SCCM YouTube channel. Be sure to keep up with the conversation and keep it going on Twitter at hashtag SCCM Live. We hope to see you all next year at the 48th Critical Care Congress in San Diego, California. I'm Andrea Fasano. Have a great day, everyone.